All right, so this morning, before we get into 1 Peter, we're going to uh, look at Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Uh, this passage is part of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's the first of the five major discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. And there in the Sermon on the Mount, it's Jesus' teaching concerning righteousness in the kingdom of God. And our passage today is found at the end of a series of teachings where Jesus is correcting popular, erroneous, religious teaching. And he's getting back to what is really the heart of God. Why did he give these commandments? What were they actually supposed to be used for? Uh, so it, it's a, a, a wonderful uh, section of of truth, of bringing back things that have been stained, things that have been tarnished, and bringing back it to its original luster. Uh, but as such, we get used to those things that are tarnished, those things that are, are erroneous, because it usually feeds our sin nature. Uh, so when Jesus is, is bringing us back, it's difficult. We fight. Uh, so as we read uh, and as we, we go over it, just be aware of that uh, and be aware of, of your own struggle or your own soul. So. The section looks like this. Jesus first started to talk about murder. You've heard it said, uh, you should not murder. Uh, and basically what the Pharisees were saying there is, uh, you, you know, you can't murder someone, but boy, oh boy, you can hate them. You know, as, as long as you don't actually do the, the deed, you can think of whatever you want in your mind. Uh, and what Jesus was saying, no, you have to have it. In the kingdom, God's righteousness has an attitude uh, that values, that does not hate. Uh, murder is about having an attitude of, of hatred and of devaluing life. Uh, the next one he goes into is adultery, uh, where he uh, quotes uh, that you should not have adultery. And uh, Jesus moves that into the idea of, of your heart, of your mind. And he talks about the attitude of lust. Uh, we have the common thought today, you can look but don't touch. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus kind of went completely opposite of that. Uh, you can have adultery in your mind. The next thing he did, which was connected, was divorce, uh, where the rabbis were teaching that you can get divorced. There were some schools that taught only for uh, infidelity. But then there was other schools that said, no, for, for any reason you can get divorced. Uh, and Jesus was saying, no, that is not the way God intended. And you need to have an attitude of oneness. Uh, that's not even an option, uh, unless it's already broken outside of your means. Uh, fourth, he talked about vows. And Jesus, uh, people were making vows. And uh, the vows were things that were, in addition to your words, some kind of promises, I vow this is true by the temple, or by uh, the earth because it's God's footstool, or by heaven because it's God's throne. It was an addition, uh, and Jesus said, you need to have an attitude of, of simple truthfulness. Your yes has to be yes, your no has to be no. There should be no need for that uh, because those vows were being used as a, a means of fooling people to being more confident uh, and so that you can lie, you can deceive, uh, where that should, should never be. People should always trust you're a man of your word. Uh, then is our passage, so let me skip that. And then he ends this section of correcting popular thinking by uh, talking about loving one's neighbor, where a Jew would say, this is just talking about other Jews. And then Jesus expands that in saying that we should have an attitude of loving everyone. And that love there is an agape love. It's a, it, it's a self-sacrificial love for the good of the other person and what's right for the other person for the glory of God. I know in the midst of these things, uh, Jesus uses uh, fantastic language, uh, rhetoric skills, uh, hyperbole, exaggeration, humor. Uh, in the first section, he talks about, if you, if you say, call someone a good-for-nothing, a uh, raka in Aramaic, uh, you'll be guilty of the, the Supreme Court. Uh, and if you call someone a fool, literally in Greek, it's moron. If you call someone a moron, you're guilty of hell. Uh, so it, he uses a hyperbole, a hyperbolic language to stress the seriousness of his exhortation. In the second section, he talks about if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. He's not talking about it. literally. It's a hyperbolic language. Again, it's used for shock value to stress the seriousness of his words. You need to take sin and the sin of lust that seriously. 
Um, the uh, third one, the divorce, he talks about if, if you, uh, in that culture, only Jewish men could have a, uh, divorced their wives. Uh, and basically he was saying, if you men, you divorce your wives, uh, they're, they're going to have to get remarried and you're causing them to, to commit adultery. And that's a, a, an amazingly paradoxical statement because a man who divorces his wife frees her from a marriage. But Jesus is saying, well, no, she's not free. Uh, the, she's not free, so she'll be, ca she'll be caused to commit adultery. So to see the, the paradox there is, wait, no, I divorced her so she could get remarried. And Jesus is saying, not in God's eyes. Uh, oaths uh, were used to assure the truthfulness uh, of, of words. Uh, and uh, it's, Jesus says, you know, don't uh, swear by uh, the heavenly throne or the earthly footstool or Jerusalem because it's the city of the king or by your own head uh, because you can't change or do anything about those things. Um, you know, if you're wrong, you, how are you going to, uh, if you swear by the temple, what are you going to do to the temple? You can't do anything. Uh, those kinds of things were words that tried to show your devotion, but it was evil because it was there uh, to try to fool people. And then finally here is another paradoxical statement, to love your enemy. If he's your enemy, you don't typically love an enemy. Uh, but that's where Jesus is, the kingdom thinking, kingdom righteousness is different than the world's. Uh, so what Jesus is teaching throughout the Sermon on the Mount is that true righteousness comes from one's heart, their heart attitude towards another. And we need to change our heart attitude to be in line with God's. Uh, true righteousness does not come from rules. It has to come from your heart, uh, from your desires, your heart. So now let's look at the passage that we skipped, our passage from today, which is Matthew 5, 38 through 42, speaks about retaliation. And Jesus is teaching on an attitude of peace. This morning, we're going to be studying Jesus' teaching on how righteousness in the kingdom of God produces an attitude of peace. Uh, like all the other sections, uh, this is divided into two parts. The first part is the misconception, and then Jesus' teaching or correction of that. So let's start with the misconception. Uh, the misconception is a common misdirected thought concerning justice. In verse 38, uh, the text says, You have heard it uh, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now this principle is known as lex talionis, which is Latin for the law of retribution. It relays a principle for justice in a legal setting, in a court setting. Uh, it's part of a widespread ancient Near East uh, law of retribution. In fact, the earliest record of this law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is from the Code of Hammurabi, who was a Babylonian king. He lived about 100 years before Moses. Uh, so it's found in many cultures, and it, it's found in the Old Testament in a few places, but in, uh, the best uh, representation is in Leviticus 24. Uh, starting in verse 17, it says, If a man takes a life of any human being, he shall uh, surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good, a life for a life. If a man injures his neighbor, uh, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. Thus the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well for the native. For I am the Lord your God. And then in Exodus and Deuteronomy, it has the same kind of principles applied to different contexts. So here, it's in a legal court setting. And the principle does two things. Number one, it makes people think twice before they act out in violence. If I uh, am thinking about uh, hitting you and knocking out your tooth, well, I'm going to think twice because... Uh, Although my flesh is telling me, and my anger is telling me to do that, I know that legally he can take me to court, and then my tooth would have to be knocked out. Uh, so it's, it's a way uh, to bring fear about a punishment that will keep you in line from doing that thing. So uh, the, the, knowing the punishment 
will reduce that crime. You'll think twice before you do it. So that's one reason uh, why this is given. The second reason is it puts a limit on retribution. Uh, our natural reaction is if I get hit, I'm going to hit 10 times harder. Uh, and thus, it's not justice. We go overboard. Uh, when we're wrong, we tend to sef selfishly overreact. We want more than just even. Uh, our anger and our resentment calls for more. And this is actually one reason why God says vengeance is mine in Romans 12, 19. Uh, but because of the hardness of human heart uh, and because of our sin nature, God gave the means of finding fair justice in the court uh, by giving this law. Uh, and in the Old Testament, we are not to take personal vengeance, but we are supposed to take them to the court so that fairness and justice will happen. So now in practice, uh, this principle uh, sets the, the legal punishment to match the crime. Uh, and it, thus, it doesn't allow for escalation. Uh, if, if you hit me and knock out my tooth, well, I'm going to knock out 10 of your teeth. And then you're going to come back and you can see how it would be a, a vicious cycle that would escalate. So in, by the first century, uh, people weren't breaking each other's bones or fractures or teeth or eyes. Uh, by that time, uh, the, the punishments were given a monetary value. And if someone injured you, you could take them to court and they would have to pay you a certain amount, a designated amount. Uh, so uh, in the Old Testament, the context is a court system. But the rabbis were using this principle to justify personal vengeance. Vengeance in one's heart. See, an eye for an eye, you're justified in being angry and resentful and bitter. Uh, he broke my arm, well, I'll make him pay. I'll take him to court. Uh, and he'll rue the day that he did that. Um, uh, have we felt that way? I think, I think we all have. Uh, and we would all like that personal satisfaction of seeing the other suffer as much as or even more than we have. Uh, and, and we like to justify our anger and the, our bitterness. Why? Why do we like to do that? Well, it's because we love sin. And we don't want to be in a place where we feel insecure or, or powerless or vulnerable. And so we, we respond in hatred, in, in anger. And like the rabbis who, who gave this justification, the scripture used it to justify sin. Like Leviticus 19.17 says, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So he's not teaching that we should need to be a doormat. He's saying you, you need to reprove. You need to correct when wronged. Uh, you need to deal with it. Uh, the, the Bible doesn't, doesn't teach that we don't stand up against evil or against sin. But our reactions and our responses should not be characterized by sin, by hatred, but by love. Desiring the legal limits of punishment of ang out of anger and hatred, that's sin. It's not loving the person. It, it is taking vengeance and using God's word to justify it. So the, the rabbis were teaching people that this is what righteousness looked like. And that this is what God has, has written about. And this is what he, he wants in his kingdom. Uh, that you can have bitterness in your heart, but take the offender to court to get even. That was not the intent of God's law, of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay, so that's the common misconception. So let's look at Jesus' teaching on righteousness. And when Jesus does this, he presents his teaching by using four examples. Uh, the first example of Jesus' teaching on righteousness, uh, the example he gives is cheeks and honor, verse 39. The text says, but, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. 
This is the first part of the verse. Uh, and he starts off with this big principle, this big um, statement, which is, uh, I say to you, do not resist the evil person. The word for resist means to set oneself against, to oppose, to be hostile towards. So then when someone does something to you, you set yourself up against them as an enemy, as someone that is now going to fight with them. Uh, If you resist, if you set yourself against a person, then you view that person as your enemy. You then become hostile. And we can't allow our hearts to accept an attitude of resistance like that, opposition as an enemy, because in that position, we will not be able to forgive or to reconcile. Those won't be options. Jesus is speaking uh, in this whole passage about controlling one's attitudes uh, towards evil people. Now, evil people are characterized by evil because they do evil things, wicked things, sinful things. And you know what? In this world, it's unavoidable. There's going to be a time where people who do evil or wicked things are going to do it to you. That's going to happen. That's out of your control. But what is in your control? Your reaction. Uh, Your attitude. And we can't allow evil to dictate our response. If you think about it, what does Satan want to do? What does he want you to do? He wants you to harm in such a way. He wants to harm, I'm sorry, he wants to harm you in such a way to hurt you in such a way, to inflict evil upon you in such a way that you want to harm and inflict evil on someone else. He wants to bring in evil into the world, more destruction, more sin, more damage. But what Jesus says is, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, uh, One would be slapped in this kind of context in a personal dispute. Uh, And it expresses an extreme insult. Uh, It's a painful sign of disrespect and rejection. Now, the text specifically says the right cheek. So if you're standing to me, most people are right-handed. So in order to hit my right cheek with your right hand, it would have to be backhanded, which is actually a greater insult. Both in Jewish and in Roman law, it was permitted for someone to prosecute this offense, to being slapped in the face. The Mishnah, which is the oral law, which was later written down, uh, says this. If he smacked him, he pays him 200 zuz. I'm not sure what a zuz is, but it's 200. Uh, But uh, if it is with the back of his hand, he pays him 400 zuz. So you can see how a backhanded slap is doubly an insult. Uh, And so that's what Jesus is saying here. If you're being greatly insulted with one of the greatest insults you can, you're supposed to turn the other cheek to him. Now this, again, is hyperbolic language. Uh, Jesus, he's speaking, if someone literally slaps you in the cheek, you're not supposed to come back up to him and say, hey, why don't you do this side as well? So we can have an equal bruise. That's not what what he's saying. What he's saying is our need to be valued, to be respected, and to be honored would naturally have us respond in kind. But uh, a physical expression of disrespect and rejection cannot be returned as an act of righteousness. We can't do something to someone else that devalues them and rejects them and, and say that that is part of God's kingdom, that I'm acting out in love. Thus, refusing to, in, to act in equal payment is turning the other cheek. Turning the other cheek is refusing to return an evil for an evil, propagating that cycle and doing the bidding of Satan. So when we turn the other cheek, we are not 
allowing ourselves to be abused. It is not teaching that. It is not saying you should lie there and be uh, physically abused or, or verbally abused. It's not saying that you should put yourself in harm's way or saying that you can't defend yourself. It's not saying that we don't oppose evil and defend others or stop wrong from happening or injustice. It's not saying any of those things. When we receive evil, when we turn the other cheek, evil doesn't have control of us. We have control of us. And we are responding out of kingdom rule and out of righteousness. Okay, so why would we do that? Why would we turn the other cheek? Why would we not, not react in kind? Uh, we would normally react in kind because we don't want to be disrespected, rejected, and devalued. But as someone that is chosen by God, part of God's kingdom, part of his family, where's our identity? Where's our supreme value and worth found? It's found in God. Our value, our honor comes from him. So that means I treasure his respect. I treasure and desire to be pleasing to him. I, I, I seek for his approval over man's. And, and, I, and I, I seek that so much so that I am ready to offer my other cheek for further dishonor from men. If that's what it takes uh, for me to stay holy and to be honoring to God. I don't want to sin against God. So it, and I value him far more that I'm willing to be dishonored even more by men. So do, evil done to me will not control my response. I will show a greater love for God than for my own value and honor among men. And that will just demonstrate a great respect and value for other people. Because I am not going to respond in kind. I'm not going to bring that anger, that wrath, that destruction, that harm to others. And by showing that greater love to others, I am demonstrating that I have received that love from God. We need to realize here, we don't want that law of retribution enacted in our own lives. We don't want God to repay us an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. We want his mercy. Uh, and even with other people, we expect and we long for mercy and, and generosity and peace. Uh, because that's, that's the kingdom way. That's the right way. We need to have that same kind of attitude as well.